Welcome to Berean Bible Church. Thank you for joining us for our Sunday morning worship service. Uh, we'll be having our Wednesday night Bible study over Zoom this week. If you want more information or instructions, let us know. Uh, the authorities continue to relax the restrictions for COVID-19. They're now allowing meetings up to 50 now, but high-risk people are advised to stay home, which uh, many, if not most, of our people are high-risk. So we're, we're still evaluating uh, what we're going to do with that. Uh, we would need to practice social distancing, six feet between families. Um, masks have to be worn under certain circumstances. We're discussing that, and we'll let you know uh, what we decide to do uh, with that when we uh, decide to make a change. Uh, as always, let us know if you have prayer requests. Uh, remember to call people if you can, especially those who live alone. I'll be reading from Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death lest my enemies say I have prevailed against him, lest those who trouble me rejoice when I have moved, am moved. But I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Let's pray. Dear God, we, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you, you have dealt bountifully with us. And most of all, in, in sending your son to come and die, to take the place that we deserved, to take the punishment we deserve on himself so that we can have eternal life if we trust in him. That even though our righteous deeds are as filthy rags, Christ died for us when we were still sinners. We thank you for that. We pray that we keep that in mind and and we pray that our hearts would be right before you, our worship would be genuine, and that you would be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, love is raining 
Let's look to the Lord in prayer before we look into the Word today. Dear Lord God, we gather together today, if, if electronically, uh, to praise and to worship you. Lord, we praise you for the mighty God that you are, from, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Lord, we praise you for your power, for your eternality. We praise you for your creation. We praise you for your sovereignty, that you are in control of all things in the universe. You always have been. You always will be. We praise you for these wonderful things. We praise you for your love, that you are a God of love, a God of compassion, that you so love the world that you gave your only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in you should not perish but have everlasting life. We praise you for your justice as well. You are a God of justice and therefore you must punish sin. You have punished sin in your son that whoever believes in him uh, would be forgiven of all sin. Lord, we praise you for all of these things. And we come to you as this great God that you are. We bring our requests before you, Lord. We we pray for this Uh, coronavirus we pray that you would bring it to an end we pray you would heal those who have it that you would prevent it from spreading we pray for those who have cancer who have other illness people who are struggling people who have lost their jobs whether permanently or temporarily through this crisis and lord we pray that this crisis would cause people to turn to you We pray you'd provide for those who are struggling financially. We pray um, that you would touch the hearts of people now, Lord, that they would turn to faith in you through this trial, that you would bring good out of it. And now, Lord, as we come to your word, we pray for insight into it. We pray you would enlighten us through your spirit who inspired these words to understand them, to apply them to our lives and to the life of our church. Lord, we open our hearts to you now. We confess any sin that might be hindering our fellowship with you. We pray that we would have close fellowship with you, that we would worship you now from our hearts, that you would be glorified. And Lord, we pray especially today that you would would comfort us through your word, that you would encourage those who are struggling, that through these encouraging words from your word, the Bible, that you would comfort and encourage those who are hurting and struggling now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're looking at Romans chapter 8. If you would like to find your way there, uh, we're picking up in verse 28, a familiar verse of Scripture, and we're just looking at this one verse today. There's so much here. Uh, as I looked at it, I was looked, looked at the passage, I was trying to decide whether I could make one message out of this verse, and after studying it for a while, I was trying to decide if I should make two messages out of it, (laughs) as some pastors have done as I looked online. Uh, But this passage is a summary, really, of the rest of the chapter. And uh, those of you who have been with us through our study on Wednesday nights will be familiar with these truths, some uh, others maybe not so much. But there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, we saw in verses 1 through 8. They are indwelt, that is, those who are in Christ Jesus are indwelt by the Holy Spirit who will raise their bodies in glory, verses 9 through 11. They receive assurance that they are God's children and His heirs, verses 14 to 16. Their present suffering shows that one day they will share His glory, verse 18. They will dwell in the new heaven and the new earth, which all creation is looking forward to, verses 19 to 22. They eagerly await their adoption, verses 23 to 25. The Holy Spirit helps them in all their weaknesses and intercedes for them 
with God the Father, verses 26 and 27. And for the rest of this chapter, the Apostle Paul speaks of the security of the believer, the security of salvation. And today in this one verse, we're going to see the certainty of security in verse 28, the extent of, the, of security, the recipients of security, and the source of security. First of all, the certainty of it. Let's look at the verse, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are the called according to his purpose. And we know. This is the certainty of security, the certainty of eternal security, the certainty of the eternal security of the believer. We know. The word translated know here is not the usual term, gnosko, that's translated no, this is the word oida, means to see, to perceive with the eyes, to perceive by any of the senses, or to know from experience, to know from experience. So the apostle knew from scripture and from personal experience that God works all things together for the good of his people. The apostle and his fellow workers knew this, and we can know. We have this information readily available to us as we're going to see. We've seen already in our study of this passage that God alone saves us and that God alone excuse me, keeps us saved. And He cannot fail. He is incapable of failure. So our salvation and the completion of it, as we saw last time, is secure. It is certain. Uh, the security of believers is absolutely certain. Secondly, we see the extent of this security. All things work together for good for those who love God. Now, all things, let me define this for you. All things means all things. Nothing is excluded. There's no qualification in this passage of Scripture, in this context. All things is unlimited. As we see later in verses 38 and 39, actually we've already looked at this in our Wednesday night study, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So all things. So not only can nothing or no one cause a believer to lose their salvation, on the contrary, everything that opposes the believer... God will work together for their good. And that's not to say that God prevents His children from experiencing anything that would harm them, but that God takes all of the things that His children experience and work them out for their good, even the worst things. And that would not be true if anything could cause a believer to lose their salvation. Then their circumstances would not be working together for their good, but for their condemnation. But that is impossible based on this verse and really this whole passage of Scripture as we've seen right from verse 1. There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And based on this verse and the verses that follow, you might want to turn to 2 Corinthians 12. I'm going to be reading from there. 2 Corinthians 12 beginning in verse 7. No matter what our situation, suffering, persecution, sin, pain, lack of faith, and all other things, God will work to produce victory and blessing so that nothing can ultimately work against us as believers. And any, any temporary harm that may come to us as believers... God will use it for our benefit. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, beginning in verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. 
Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When I am weak... When we are put in a in position where we must acknowledge our own weakness. When we realize our own weakness, we can better trust in God's strength and His strength can better work through us. So all things includes basically two categories of things. Good things and bad things. <laughs> I guess you could stick another category in between of things that are in between, the good and bad. But primarily good and bad. It's not rocket science, is it? So this includes things that are good and beneficial to believers, and as well as things that are bad and harmful. They all work together. The word translated work together here is a Greek word, sunergeo. It's a compound word from ergeo, to work and soon, together with. So work together with. We get our English word synergism from this word. Synergism means the working together of various elements to produce an effect greater than and often completely different from the sum of each element acting separately. Uh, The word work together here is singular, and the word translated all things is plural, So in the Greek, it cannot be the subject of this sentence. All things cannot be the subject of this sentence. We have to look for another subject that matches the singular verb. So work together, sunerge, is third person singular. So it could be translated this way. He works all things together. In the Greek language, the subject is included in the verb depending on the verb form. So I work, he works, she works. In this case, he, she, or it works together. So if we use the Greek word order, it becomes evident who the he is here. It could be translated this way. And we know that to those who love God, he works all things together for good. This is the active voice. In other words, the subject is doing the action. God is the one who does this. This is important because many of our English translations make it sound like all things automatically work together for good, and that's not what's being said here. New American Standard Bible translates this verse, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to His purpose. And the present tense here in the original language indicates a continuous action. He always does this, continually, in all things. He always works all things together for good for those who love Him and who are called according to His purpose. So it's not that things in themselves work together to produce good. Paul has made it clear and will make it abundantly clear that it is God's will and God's power that causes all things to work together for good. David said, All the paths of the Lord are loving kindness and truth to those who keep His covenant and His testimonies. Psalm 25, 10. And you may say, What about... Almost everybody has a what about. What about the Christian who loses their dear, loving spouse? How is that for their good? Well, notice... It doesn't say that all things are for their good. It says that God works all things together for their good. God takes the bad and makes it work out for good for the believer. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 and 17 says, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing. Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. 
that this principle transcends life on earth. You know, we tend to look at things from an earthly perspective. But God doesn't do that. He sees things... He sees things from an eternal perspective, and we should too. Believers die, sometimes young. But even that, God works together for their good. As Paul said, For I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Philippians 1, 23. To depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Paul is not advocating suicide here, which is self-murder. But he's simply saying that to depart and be with Christ is far better. It's far better up there than it is down here. Psalm 116, verse 15 says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. God loves it when believers die because they go to be with Him. And he loves them, and he longs to see them. So even death, God works together for good for the believer. If you're in in our passage in Romans 8, you can look down at verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God works all these things and more together for the good of his people. And you might say, what is that good? Well, we may not always know in this life, but there are some good things that are mentioned in this context that God works all things together for. That is, to be conformed to the image of His Son, verse 29, that we would grow to be more like Christ, and ultimately we will be like Him, for we will see Him as He is. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren, verse 29. That Christ would be preeminent in all things. The firstborn. And as we saw a few weeks ago in verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And I think this is the primary good that God works all things together for. God works all things together for the ultimate and increased glory of His people. So we see the certainty of security, the extent of security, which is unlimited, (laughs) all things. And we see the recipients of security. To those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. To those who love God. Now, we've seen in our study of the book of Romans on Wednesday nights, we've seen the Apostle Paul use many different designations for Christians. He refers to Christians as those who love God. All Christians love God. Some more than others. It doesn't say that God works all things together for good for everyone. The recipients we see, first of all, here are those who love God. Unbelievers do not love God. We saw back in Romans 5, verse 10, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. If when we were enemies, is speaking of before we were believers, before we were Christians, we were enemies of God. Jesus said, He who is not with me is against me. Matthew twelve thirty. So those who love God, the word love translates agapao, the verb form of the familiar word agape, it refers to an unselfish, sacrificial love. 
Strong just defines this love as a love that finds no excellency in its objects. That is, God loves us not because we are lovable, but because He is loving. And believers are called to love God unselfishly and sacrificially, and we do to some extent, and we're growing in that love. We are called to love more, more and more all the time. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Love is in the present tense here, which again indicates continuous action. We will always love God forever and ever. In Ephesians 6.24, Paul refers to Christians as those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with a love incorruptible. And that word incorruptible in Ephesians 6.24 can be translated unceasing, always, or eternal. Eternally. So we will love God forever and ever. And as I mentioned, we're commanded to love God and others. But love does not originate with us. 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. And he who does not love does not know God. For God is love. So love is of God. And that little word of there can be translated from. Love is from God. That's where it comes from. We love Him because He first loved us. So the recipients of security are called those who love God. And secondly, those who are the called. So this is another title that the apostle uses to refer to believers. Those who are the called. There are two different callings in Scripture in relation to salvation. A general call and an effectual call. Effectual means successful in producing the intended results. Uh, the word translated called here is a Greek word, kletos. It can mean invited by God in the proclamation of the gospel to obtain eternal salvation in the kingdom through Christ. Okay, that's the general call. Invited. Secondly, and this is from Strong's, it says divinely selected and appointed. This is the effectual call. Divinely divinely selected and appointed. Divinely meaning by God. Selected and appointed by God for salvation. Jesus said, many are called, but few are chosen. Again, the general call, many are called. And God commands all men everywhere to repent. Acts 17.30 But throughout the epistles, as here, it refers to this effectual call, uh, producing the intended result. Okay. Um, Walter Elwell from uh, Evangelical Dictionary of Theology says, God's sovereign action in securing a response to his summons. The verb call and the noun calling, klesis, now refer to the effective evocation of faith through the gospel by the secret operation of the Holy Spirit, who unites men to Christ according to God's gracious purpose in election. Okay, and there's a list of scriptures there. If you would like these quotes and the scriptures that go along with them, let me know and I can email them to you. Uh, Elwell goes on to say, The called are those who have been subjects of his work, i.e. elect believers. Another list of scriptures. Uh, Dr. John MacArthur says, The sovereign regenerating work of God in a believer's heart that brings him to new life in Christ. And he's commenting on this very word in this very same passage. Uh, MacArthur goes on to say, Paul explains the meaning of those who are called in the following two verses, 29 and 30, where he speaks of what theologians often refer to as God's effectual call. In this sense, all those who are called are chosen and redeemed by God and are ultimately glorified. They are securely predestined by God to be his children and to be conformed to the image of his son. John Whitmer from Bible Knowledge Commentary <clears throat> excuse me, Bible Knowledge Commentary, says, called means more than being invited to receive Christ. It means to be summoned to and given salvation. And he cites um, Romans 1.6, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. You are, you are 
also the called. So again, believers are called the called. (laughs) And in our passage in verse 30, Romans 8, 30, Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. Now we've seen in our study of Romans that justified means to be made righteous or to be made right with God. Those whom he called, these he also justified. All of the called in this sense, in the effectual sense, all of the called are justified. All of them are made right with God, which identifies this call as an effectual call. Everett Harrison from Expositor's Bible Commentary says, The called are not those who merely, excuse me, the called are not those who are merely invited to respond to the proclamation of the gospel. They are called according to God's electing purpose. Okay, as it says here, we're called according to his purpose. William Hendrickson, um, Baker's New Testament Commentary, says, Those who were effectively called, they are those whose hearts and minds were so thoroughly influenced by the Holy Spirit that they became aware of their sinfulness, began to understand their need of Christ, and embraced Him as their Lord and Savior. And he lists a bunch of scriptures there as well. See, one of them being Romans 1.7. Um, and another one is 1 Corinthians 1.23. And I, I'm going to read from there, if you want to turn there. 1 Corinthians 1.23. Um, but I want to confuse you by quoting Romans 1.7 while you're turning there. Uh, he says, To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Called to be saints. Called to be holy ones. And 1 Corinthians 1.23 and 24 says, But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. See, to those who are called, the gospel is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Those who are called here is used, again, synonymously with believers, referring to believers. Uh, Again, William Hendrickson, Baker New Testament Commentary, says, No one can ever truly love God unless, first of all, he is effectively called. In other words, the apostles of the Gentiles is here expressing substantially the same thought as he did, as did the apostle John when he wrote, we love God because he first loved us. We love God because he loved us in an effectual sense. That is, he saved us. We love him because he saved us. He loved us by saving us. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him. In love, he chose us. And the apostle is going to explain this doctrine in detail in the next four chapters. So if you want to know more about this, uh, join us on Wednesday nights for our study of Romans. So we've seen the certainty of security, the extent of security, the recipients of security. Now we see the source of security according to his purpose. God causes all things to work together for the good of his children because that is according to his divine purpose. And Paul explains the meaning of God's purpose in verses 29 and 30. Um, But we're going to look at, and we looked at that in our Wednesday night study, but uh, we're going to look at Isaiah 46 here for a moment if you'd like to turn there. Isaiah 46 verse 9. God's broader purpose is to offer salvation to all mankind. But in Romans 8.28, he is speaking of the narrower meaning of God's purpose. That is his plan to save those whom he has called and predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. Verse 29. Isaiah 46, uh, beginning in verse 9, says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man who executes my counsel from a far country. Indeed, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. 
God says. Familiar words of John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of the will of God. Those who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. That's how it reads. But that's what it's saying. We're born, born again, not of the will of man, but of God's will, God's purpose. So as we can see from those verses, God's calling and purpose do not eliminate the need for personal faith. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name. Jesus said, All that the Father gives me shall come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. An English writer once wrote a story about a janitor at St. Peter's Church in London. One day a young priest discovered that the janitor was illiterate and fired him. With no job and no education, the man invested his meager savings in a tiny shop where he prospered and bought another one and continued this process until he ended up with a chain of stores worth a lot of money. One day the man's banker said, You've done well for an illiterate, but where would you be if you could read and write? And the man smiled and replied, I would be a janitor. It's a good thing that our salvation is all up to God. If it was up to us, we wouldn't be saved at all. Again, in verse 35, if you're still in Romans 8, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Far from separating us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, God works all these things together. All these things and more, He works together for the good of His people. If you are a Christian... Whatever you are going through, or ever will go through, God is working and will work together for your good. Whether it's COVID-19, whether it's cancer, whether it's loss of a loved one, some tragedy in your, in your life or a family, whatever it is, God is working it together for your good. Dear Lord God, we thank you for these wonderful truths that nothing really bad can permanently harm a believer. Lord, we pray you comfort us with this knowledge that you work all things, no matter how bad they are. You work them all together for our good. Lord, we pray you'd help us to remember these truths. Help us to understand them. Help us to believe them. Help us to trust in, in this truth. It's one thing to know it intellectually. It's another thing to, to really trust in it, to really believe it in our own personal lives and in our circumstances. Lord, help us to do that. Help us to remember, Lord, that you are doing this in our lives, that you're working all these things together, that we can never be lost, that you will keep us saved and that you will work all these things together for our good. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
close our time in a word of prayer. Dear Lord God, as always, we pray that we would apply these truths that we've learned here to our lives. Help us never to forget, Lord, that you are working all things together for our good. Uh, Again, we pray we would understand these truths and apply them to our our own personal lives, the lives of our families, and the life of our church. We pray that we would go from this place uh, encouraged and strengthened in you, that we would trust in you, that you would work through us. Uh, We pray that uh, we would be a a good testimony to those around us. We pray that we would have opportunity to share the gospel. We pray you would give us boldness to do that and wisdom to do it fruitfully. We pray you would use us, Lord, to lead others to faith in you. We pray you would use us to strengthen, to encourage other believers uh, for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a blessed day and a blessed week.